It gives me great pleasure to start our panel now by introducing Paul Emery. In 2008, I was discharged from hospital homeless. And I know now from my subsequent experience with homeless charities that I was very fortunate to become homeless in Gateshead. I now work for Crisis as a session tutor. What is it you're hoping to stimulate in the mind of the student? Mm -hmm. I think this is a very innovative project. This is the first time in the history of this country that a draft to recognise, draft piece of legislation to recognise uh, access to housing, access to healthcare, access to social benefits, ask human rights. It's the first time that this has been done. And I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a reason to be cheerful and proud to the university, really, that, uh, that we are the ones that, uh, that hosted the team that came up with this, with this product. I'm delighted to introduce John Bowden. So this is going to be a, a, a fairly informal kind of talk. It's going to be pretty discursive. It's going to be uh, highly selective. At peak in 1981, there were over 5 million council homes in this country. Over one third of the population lived in council housing. The 1949 Housing Act, uh, landmark legislation, was the first housing act to remove the stipulation that council housing be designated as housing for the working class. Yes, I want to pick up on one of the themes that, that, that John sort of hinted at, which is specifically the rights of homeless people in the UK, which are actually unique um, internationally, um, both in terms of their advantages, but I think it's also important to note what some of the disadvantages uh, might be. The hugely important question that you have raised about you know, having to be critical, what is the value added of a rights approach, is really something, it's one of the central themes of today, and I'm really delighted that it was put out you know, front and centre in that way. Thank you so much. So I think it is very important that this is happening in Newcastle. The North East and the city have a long tradition of uh, social justice activism. Alistair, if that's okay, would you come here and read uh, Lucrece's statement? I thought it would get better after I got my own place, but unfortunately it didn't. If we are to change how people on benefits are treated, we need to help those who need it the most. I'm thankful that I'm on the road to, to getting better, but there are so many of us that need your help, not only to change the way we get the help in the benefit system, but to be listened to so we can tell you what we need. Sad that we have to listen to testimonies like that. I've been listening to them for the last 10 years. Things have got worse, not better. A million and a half people are going to lose a thousand pounds through universal credit in the next year. You can stretch your food budget, often with compromise, but you can't stretch other parts of your budget. Our last speaker on this session is Dr. Amy Clare, who is currently a research fellow in social policy. I'm talking about my work that links housing and health and really trying to emphasize the overlapping nature of these rights. Housing is now part of the immigration system with the right to rent. So we're filtering people into tenures and not doing enough within housing policy to ensure that when you're in that tenure, your health is not negatively impacted. In recent years, in recent months, we have seen uh, a transformation, a more vocal uh, recognition and proclamation that social rights matter. I'm supposed to find myself dashing out between morning surgery with a piece of paper with a brief set of notes into a stream of care homes, seeing some really complicated, really disadvantaged, um, very aged people generally, who needed a lot of time, a lot of attention, a lot of care. Newcastle University's support for the Article 22 project is, is really great and entirely appropriate given the university's mission and, and, and desires and I think being vested in the, uh, in the north east of England which has suffered considerably under austerity projects and through continued um, and increased uh, inequalities I think it's, it's, not, it's not a coincidence that uh, this project has, uh, has originated there. I'm going to focus on two things, money and care. I think we could all agree that you know, access to good quality care is something that, that should be available to everybody. And it also needs to be provided in a socially and financially sustainable way. And I guess that's where my interests come in, because I'm interested in, in organisation and finance. Access to these things is part of social citizenship. It's part of what we should expect to contribute to and to receive as part of a safe and civilised life. The process began as a technical exercise, really, uh, by developing and creating a team of people, uh, some academics and some practitioners that we're going to look at different options of recognising socioeconomic rights in the law. So things like health, access to housing, access to social security, ask human rights issues. 
is currently UK law doesn't recognize that, that these things are human rights. International law does, but domestic law doesn't. Thank you, and it's nice to have Charlene, who will speak on nursing home violations of human rights in the US and UK. In thinking about human rights, uh, it's, I certainly think it should apply to nursing homes because we want to protect people from abuse and neglect and make sure they have adequate health care services. The largest for-profit nursing homes, the largest chains, and other for-profit companies have the lowest staffing. And so it's not a big surprise that the for-profit companies, especially the largest, of 15 largest nursing home companies, have the worst quality in terms of the violations of the regulations. Our goal was really to, uh, to start from scratch with the legal exercise of what would a piece of legislation that tries to do that look like. And after a year and a half, we produced a draft, which we opened for consultation, and we're receiving feedback at the moment. And when we are happy with the draft, then it will be up for any member of parliament to consider tabling it as a private member's bill, so as a, as a, as a backbencher bill, or alternatively, a political party could consider you know, including it as part of their manifesto, and, and eventually, having convincing a majority in parliament to turn it into the law of the land. I know what it's like to be skint. I know what it's like to be skint. The thing that you need most are services that never demean and always protect your dignity. This can be done absolutely anywhere. Just to give you a sense of maybe the scale, um, which I think is not always very well understood, um, so in 2016, it was estimated that 8% of people um, experienced low or very low food security, which means that they're compromising both the amount of food that they're eating and also the types of food. And we heard from Martin about people buying cheap food, not very nourishing food, um, because that's what keeps people fed. If I were a student, I were you know, 17 or 18 years old, and I, and I watched this video, I think I would be particularly interested in the fact that this is a piece of academic work that uh, aims at making a difference in people's lives. It's impactful research, it's about you know, contributing with academic, rigorous academic research towards changing policies that eventually will make people's lives better.